let's talk about that because one of the debates that was had, you may be aware of this, that there was uh, you know, this debate going on within the electric bicycle industry among some of the industry leaders about this type of technology, this all-in-one wheel technology. And the concern was is that whereas I can have a dedicated battery pack and you can have a 750 watt motor uh, and that gives you, you know, enough torque and enough range that that you've got a bicycle that exceeds a regular bicycle's performance. Well, well, the specs you just gave are super specs, but let's uh, let's go with that. Right. Uh, I'm I'm completely off on the battery specs. I apologize for that. It's amp hours. What I'm thinking. Sorry. Yeah, but, uh, but let, let's imagine you have a battery of so sort of average capacity, uh, more or less. So between. 200 watt hours, you can go all the way up to uh, infinity if you got no limitation of space, right? right? You could make it as big as you want. <laughs> 200, 300, 400, 500, 600 watt hours, 700, 1 kilowatt hours. You can stick it all on a bike. Of course, it's going to cost and it's going to be expensive, but right. it's going to be heavy, sorry. But yes, you have much more freedom to choose components. Right. So, so the argument was is that this, this would much better match our much better match a a novice new bike e-bike riders expectations to what an electric bicycle will be as opposed to the all-in-one system which may help a little bit on the hills but it won't it won't give them the same experience that you know they might have with the more dedicated uh, individualized component system so what's your response i mean how do you answer that well, of course, you can. I mean, if you push it to the limit, you can make the bicycle into a motorcycle, right? <laughs> right? Well, true. <laughs> you could, <laughs> and, some, right? and some do that <laughs> with a strong enough motor and and, uh, and and enough batteries. If you can, if you really have the freedom of moving out of this shell and expanding the size of the component, then definitely performance will increase. But I don't think that's what people are looking for. I think people are looking for bicycles that they could ride the way they do when they ride their one or two mile ride, which is something that most people are convenient in do, with doing. Right. Just go to the grocery store, ride my one, two, three miles, leisure, get to work or get to pick up my kids or pick up the groceries or just stroll for fun. Right. If I could do that and cover 10 miles, I'd be happy. I don't need the turbo version with the flames all over. Right. I'm an urbanite who wants right. to get to work. It's a different segment. If you're talking about performance and you want to, if you want to compete in mountain bikes, if you want to talk about uh, a, a recreational applications, extreme sports, it's a totally different conversation, right? Then weight balancing, increasing the capacity as much as you can, that weight versus performance, all these types of trade-offs become very important. But for the average person who wants to get from home to work, right, or to move around or to go see their friends, the application is different. It's not about the extra 10 newton meters of torque at startup, right? It might be about range. It might be about how does this wheel look with my miniskirt, right? You know what I mean? <laughs> Well, well, let me ask you this then. One of the questions I always get asked, this happened actually uh, last week when I was testifying uh, regarding a, a bill that I've introduced um, or helped introduce in our local uh, state government. Um, they, the question that these senators were always asking me is, do I have to pedal this bike to recharge it? And in the case of the bike that I had on demonstration, of course, uh, that was just, you know, a typical electric bicycle where you plug the charger into the bike and the charger goes into the grid and you get charged from that. So how much, um, how much does my pedaling charge that bike and how much extra work does that put on me uh, as the rider? Obviously, if I'm coasting downhill, I'm going to get some regenerative braking. If I'm slowing the bike... Uh, and the and the regen braking kicks in that keeps the battery charged. But how do I, as the, as I'm pedaling along, am I working harder to keep the bike moving and keep the battery charged than I would if I were just riding a normal road bike? 
I'll uh, give you the short answer and the long answer. Okay. The short answer is it's all it's, it's all in software. Okay. Okay. So assuming that you know the the audience of EV World uh, is somewhat technical, I want to go get get back get go down to the nitty gritty details. There's not we sell the wheel with an app. You download the app for free, okay. and it has five different modes that are pre-programmed into the app. Okay. We call it a turbo mode, standard mode, eco mode, uh, exercise mode, and flatten my city mode. Okay. So, and you can easily imagine what each, what each of them does. Turbo just gives you as much boost as it can, depending on the amount of energy it has in the batteries. Eco optimizes for range. Normal is an average between the two. Exercise makes it harder to ride than it would be otherwise. And flatten my cities makes going uphill feel as if you're going on a plane and going downhill feels as if you're going on a plane. Just flattens the hill. Okay, got it. All right, it regenerates going down. It pushes you going up. Got it. Uh, so, but all these things are written on our API on the server. These are apps. Flatten my city is an app you download to your Copenhagen Wheel app. Okay. So it's a, it's a mode you download. And users can program their own modes. If you want to work harder when you pedal, it's a parameter you define. Okay. You can pick it. If you, wanna, if you want it to be just as easy as riding a bicycle without the Copenhagen Wheel, you can program that in and make that a mode. Okay. If you want it only to help you uphill and nothing else, it's another mode. So it's very easy to customize. Okay. Your question is more related to the types of modes we ship it with built in. So when, you, when it's built in, with the built-in modes, it's not harder to pedal than, when it, than it would be otherwise. Flatten my city uh, or uh, eco mode or turbo mode, standard mode, they all assist. So they okay. all give you push unless you're trying to brake. When you're trying to brake, the brake happens electronically in as much as we can okay. until you have to stop with a mechanical brake. Okay, uh, yeah. so well, let me ask you about the braking part then. So is this uh, uh, the braking somewhat like a coaster brake where I simply just put reverse pressure on the, on the pedals to get that to do that? Is it a hand grip or does it sense when I'm going downhill, I've let up, it does it automatically? I mean, how does that work? Just curious. Um, it's the, it's the latter too. So we do, we both, we sense slope. Right. And with the slope, we decide how much assist you get or how much braking regeneration you get when you okay. go down. The other thing is we detect the position of the pedals so that when you start to pedal backward, the motor goes into regenerator mode. All right. So it's like, it's like an electronic version of a coaster brake. Got but it. the nice thing is that you can do it on a derailleur bike. Okay. Now you can enable that or disable that. By the way, again, in in, in the in, in the in, in the, the settings. App. Yeah. Um, one of the questions that was asked though is, can these motors, since it's all in one, batteries, controllers, all that electronics, the motors, I assume gearing in there, what are the chances that this thing that you're going to have heating problems going up a hill, for example, or you're putting a lot of load on the bike? It's a very good point. So if you wanted to push. A, a 50th percentile male up a, a, up a 5% grade for more than one minute, you're operating at much higher wattage uh, than, than, than the average 250 or 350 watts, just for a burst, right? And a motor's uh, power rating is basically proportional to its capacity to dissipate heat. So to say that in layman terms, um, if you don't extract that heat quickly, your motor, your, your system is gonna is gonna be damaged, or you're gonna have to slow down the rider. Right. So, we, the two, so what we're doing is we're using the propulsion of the wheel in order to uh, bring uh, airflow and cool the system in a particular way. Okay. Uh, so we're getting some advantage from the packaging that we've developed with respect to cooling. Okay. Uh, and that allows us to prolong the amount of push you get going uh, at, uh, you get at high demand applications. 
So uphill is one. Also, if you want to accelerate uh, significantly for a long period of time. Right. One of the questions, of course, I always get asked about any electric vehicle, whether it's an automobile or whether it's a bicycle, is what happens when you ride it through water? So in this case, if you're cooling that motor, I assume with some kind of, uh, maybe not venting, but, you know, exercise surface area or whatever, what happens when I ride that thing through a puddle? So DC motors could handle being submerged. Okay. All right. That's not the problem. Our motor is fully enclosed just because we don't want gunk to get in there in the right. space between the magnets and the coils. Right. Our electronics is fully enclosed, but the space in between is rather free, uh, freely open for flows. Okay. So you can, from a warranty standpoint, we ask people not to ride in their pools. Right? It's just not good for your battery. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, and, uh, but, but if you end up submerging it for a short amount of time, it should survive. Right. The electronics is, is potted, right. and the motor can handle the, the, the water even if it, if it gets through the ceiling uh, around the motor enclosure. We do not plan to have this written underwater. <laughs> okay. No, well, I was thinking, for example, if you're riding on a trail somewhere and you're crossing a, a shallow stream of some kind, you know, three, four inches deep. We whatever. haven't had any problems so far. Yeah. I mean, let's say Boston riding, we're riding these days, and it hasn't been the driest of season. Yeah, no kidding. Wow. What well, you guys have really been hammered back there. Um, here's one of my really big questions. How in the world did you generate so much positive media coverage? You were everywhere. <laughs> I'm jealous. I want to know what you did and how you did it. <laughs> Honestly, first of all, thanks a lot. We, you know, I, I don't think we did much. I, I, it, it, uh, the story speaks for itself, I think. Ever since we started talking about this project, it seemed to have struck a nerve. The, you know, for, I'll, I'll tell you something personal about myself. So through the, through the, throughout the two and a half, three years that the project was at our lab, at Sensible City Lab at MIT, under development, we had about 70 projects uh, with different cities around the world, sponsored by some of the uh, uh, by, by leading industry uh, members. A lot of the projects generated a lot of attention. Right. Okay? And, and were published in the academic literature, patented getting a lot of media attention, shown in the best museums uh, around the world, like MoMA and the Biennale in Venice and Centre Pompidou, many other places. What made it different with this project is that beyond the media, people at home started emailing us. We've collected more than 25,000 emails just when it was at MIT. Right? People <laughs> yeah. saying, where can I get one? This will change my life. I want to... I, I, I want to I ride a bicycle more than I ride my car, but I can't find an alternative that I like. And so these were like, these were kind of moving because pe people in an unsolicited way reach out. The individual at home doesn't usually reach out to an academic research group right. lab. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and that's part of what prompted me to take a step back uh, from the lab at MIT. As much as I enjoy it, and it's a, it's a baby uh, of mine in many ways, um, to and, and to invest this time in growing super pedestrian and, and 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 building this fantastic team here to bring it to market. So I think the media uh, is just a result of the fact that the story speaks for itself. And we have, we, I mean, look, the video we've had a production company that helped produce it, uh, but in many ways it was done in house. The animator was a friend. The music was done by my fiance. Uh, I wrote the script, and it went viral, right? It, it, yeah. it got, it, it got three-something million views in three weeks. Yeah. I think the story just speaks for itself. Uh, well, let me, me ask you, so, so why the name change? You had all, you've got the world thinking about this big red hub motor on that white bicycle, Copenhagen wheel, you know, and now super pedestrian? Who's this? So what spurred that? So the name hasn't changed. The product is still called the Copenhagen Wheel, uh, but the company that builds this product is called Super Pedestrian. And this is us, and 
our vision is really focusing on urban mobility in general. So how can we transform urban mobility is our mission statement. And uh, we thought a, a great way to do this would be to start by commercializing the Copenhagen Wheel. So Copenhagen Wheel is very much the name. Okay, still the name, but the company that's, that's selling it, which of course then brings me up to where are you at in your business plan? You took me around the shop, you showed me, you know, people that are working on different things, your machine shop, your test benches and things like that. Where are you guys at in terms of actually delivering product or is that your intention? So we, uh, the, uh, in December last year, 2013, we started a pre-order campaign of uh, our pre-industrialized release. Okay, so this is a pre-industrialized uh, version of the Copenhagen wheel, the last one, let's say, before a fully industrialized version. Uh, we opened it for pre-order to the public. Thousands of people have been ordering them, okay. which we're very grateful to for the support. And uh, our first production run is beginning in April, uh, and we'll be, we'll, re we'll be releasing them consecutively thereafter to the people on a first-come, first-served basis. Usually it's about six months from the moment people order until they get it, okay. more or less. Right. Uh, people are still ordering them. Uh, and um, what else is there to say from a development standpoint? We're already working on our, on our fully commercial release, the following one. And there's a lot of excitement in the team. The team is growing as well. We're hiring anything from designers to mechanical engineers, app designers. Right. Uh, uh, we're working on streaming APIs. There's a, whole, a hell of a lot of development happening yeah. here in-house. So, so, so what is it that, in fact, you're actually going to be delivering to people? Is it just the wheel and they're going to have to take it down to their local uh, Trek shop or whatever, and the bike shop, and have them re-spoke? their current wheel or are you sending them an entire wheel with the rim and then they put their own tires on it? What, what are you delivering? So um, I'm hoping that people will be able to do it at home. It depends on one's level of expertise, but it does, it's not really different from installing any other rear wheel. Right? So we're go, you, in, in the package, you're going to get the red hub okay. spoke to a rim of your choice. Okay. So users tell us if it's a 700C or a 26-inch wheel, which are the two choices we offer, right. covering the majority of bikes out there. Right. Uh, and then you're going to tell us the color, if it's silver or, or black. Uh, and then people tell us uh, also the number of gears they have on the rear wheel. Okay. How many, how, how many speed cassette uh, do they have there? And we ship it fully installed okay. with a tire as well. Oh, okay. Okay. If somebody wants to have their original tire on on their wheel, they're welcome to switch back right. to the original tire. But you should be the idea is that you'll take it out, put it on your bike with the two screws, right? Download the app and start riding. All right. That that's pretty cool. Okay. So talk about pricing, warranty, and we already talked about product availability. So where are you at on on pricing on this? When you've got it, obviously the pre-introductory price, then you're going to have Commercial price. So, what are you what are you looking for? Target so the price is now the, the price now is seven ninety nine, so okay. around eight hundred dollars uh, for uh, for the wheel itself um, and the app you get for free, of course. So you can download once uh, uh, as soon as you uh, start right. using the wheel, and that's about it. I'm not sure what the what kind of warranty. Was there, I forgot what was the rest of your question. Oh, I just asked you on the warranty, what, uh, what are you going to do with respect to warranty then? Ah, okay, sure. So from a price, let me repeat then this whole sentence, okay? Uh, I'll just repeat the question because I forgot what was the second half uh, uh, for your editing purposes. Right. So um, prices, uh, price at the moment is $7.99 for the wheel, so around $800. Right. You get the, you get the app with it as well. Uh, warranty is a minimum of one year okay. for parts, including the battery. Um, and where the law requires that it's longer on certain components, we comply with the local law. Okay. So different countries have different regulations with respect to consumer electronics, and we adhere by those as a bare minimum for what we support. Okay. Uh, on the warranty, or at least on, on the, uh, the batteries, what, uh, 
can, can you, are you anticipating at some point if the technology improves, uh, greater density and you know new chemistry and things like that, can they upgrade or do they just recycle that wheel and get a new whole new kit? I guess this is the iPhone phenomenon, right? Do I do I throw the iPhone away and get a new iPhone because the battery's bad, or, or how are you planning on handling that? So uh, I would like to differentiate between two things. First of all, this is our pre-industrialized release, right? So here we're working with our early adopters and people who really want it uh, in order to uh, bring this uh, product to the world and uh, get feedback from people. We're working very closely in terms of customer service through interaction with people. Some people, for example, don't know much about their bikes, so we really talk them through the process of an understanding what size wheel they got, how many gears, very hands-on at the moment. Uh, looking at this uh, particular release, we're going to allow people who would want to then upgrade to the fully commercial release to have preferential terms, okay. so to do it at a, at a relatively low cost. Batteries will be upgradable always. These are removable batteries. So you always be able to upgrade the batteries. Upgrade motor and hardware is more difficult, right. but we're also going to strive for this with this with the upcoming commercial release. Um, the uh, with relate with relation to battery, I, I'm I'm sure that uh, everyone who works in the in, in the EV world uh, has the same uh, has the same issue. This is way beyond uh, the our control, of course, because we're not dealing with chemistry. Uh, we're working with whatever we think works best for our product. There's a lot you can do in terms of battery management and, 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 and thermal uh, um, heat dissipation management uh, in order to make the performance of batteries better. Uh, but with regard to uh, you know, new technologies, yes, we're hopeful and we'll, uh, we'll integrate as quickly as we can if something, uh, if something new and better comes around. Okay. For the time being... Sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to ask you that uh, one, of the, one of the joys of people, you know, that have, for example, a Tesla Model S is that the company can do upgrades and recall modifications wirelessly, right? They just dumps it down from the cloud and updates. Is this going to be a capability? I'm assuming because there's going to be changes as you, as you progress along here. Um, can, will you have that capability built in? We've been doing uh, firmware updates uh, through Bluetooth via the mobile phone for four years. In the okay. Three and a half, maybe. Right. So it's, it's a central part of the customer service model. Um, we are able to log into users' wheels via their phone and do remote diagnostics and, and, and improve software. So certainly. Right. Right. Very cool. Great. Hey, well, Asif, thank you so much for uh, for taking the time. And I guess at some point I need to get a hold of one of those wheels just for myself. <laughs> well, we'd we'll be, we'll be thrilled. And if you're in the Cambridge area, come drop by our workshop here. All right. That sounds good. I appreciate it. We've, yeah, had, with, we've had with us uh, Asif uh, Bitterman at uh, Super Pedestrian talking about the Copenhagen wheel. Best of luck with it, Asif. Good luck. Thank you very much, Bill. All okay. the best. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.